know that your customer base is about to increase by tens of millions of people. It's true. The silver tsunami of baby boomers is getting ready to crash on the shore of mortality. As Mitch Rose told us yesterday, 10,000 people are turning 65 every single day. And this will continue for the next 15 years. Now, while the demographics are in your favor, less than 30% of adults do any end-of-life planning. And that's being generous. However, the baby boomers are changing the conversation. You as pre-need funeral planning and cemetery professionals know how hard it can be to get the conversation started. Well, over the past 10 years, there has been a rise in death discussion movements in the English-speaking world. And we're going to take a stroll through what these death discussion movements are and how you can get involved. All of these movements are designed to normalize conversations around death and dying, to make it easier for us to plan ahead. It started in 2009 in England with Dying Matters, a coalition that was founded to get people to talk about death and dying and put it on the national agenda. They held their first Dying Matters Awareness Week in 2010. Now it's interesting, the coalition was initially started by a hospice and palliative care organization, and then the National Health Service of England, the government, and Hospice UK started funding Dying Matters Awareness Week. So this is like if Medicare funded this kind of public outreach. I don't think that's going to happen here in the United States. Remember what happened in 2009? when it was suggested Medicare doctors talk to their patients about end-of-life issues? Death panels! So we won't have government funding of this kind of activity anytime soon, I don't think. But when they had their first Dying Awareness Week events, they only had a handful in 2010. In 2018, there were more than 500 events around the country, all indicated by those blue blue dots on the maps, and the way to get involved was an open source conversation. If you had an event, you could become a part of it. And what were those events? They are death cafes, which you'll find about momentarily, theater, art, poetry, visits to funeral homes and cemeteries and anatomy labs speakers and panel discussions, a whole host of activities. Not only does Dying Matters Awareness Week place the conversation in people face to face, but you also get news stories related to planning ahead. Here's a story from the Daily Mirror which talks about the cost of funerals. Now, 3,700 pounds, the last time I checked, the exchange rate is $4,667. Funeral poverty is a real concern in England, and I would say to you, there are a lot of people here in the United States who are also concerned about how do they afford a funeral. So these are concerns that you can step up and help answer Hello, pre-need planning, you can pay that over time in a, in a affordable monthly chunk. So it can help get the conversation started in that way. Next, the Death Cafe movement in 2011. This is John Underwood. He founded the Death Cafe movement. He was inspired by the work of a Swiss sociologist named Bernard Cretaz who held in France at cafes. You have a little coffee or tea, some cake or cookies, and you talk about what's on your hearts and minds about mortality issues. 
the, uh, he held his first death cafe in the basement of his home in London, and our first death cafes were held in the United States in 2012. I held the first one west of the Mississippi. It's interesting that people are more comfortable talking to strangers about death-related issues than they are with their own families. Now here's an idea. You could bring a death cafe to your funeral home or your cemetery if you have a chapel. A reception area if you've installed that. You provide the refreshments, do a little PR. It's a great opportunity to get in the news if you haven't had a death cafe in your market. One of the elements of holding a death cafe and being able to call it a death cafe is you have to abide by their rules. The rules are it has to be held on a not-for-profit basis. You have to have the refreshments. It's a safe, supportive space to have this conversation. So what, what gets said in the death cafe stays in the death cafe. And you cannot lead anyone to a particular course of action, belief, or conclusion. It's led by the participants, this conversation. So as a way of getting involved, you can be involved and tell your own stories about death and funerals that you've been involved with, your family, your staff can get involved. It is an opportunity to make an authentic connection with people who might not otherwise come to the funeral home. And by the way, offering a tour, a behind the scenes tour, is a really good idea. People are curious. They want to know about what goes on at funeral homes. Australia got involved in 2012 with Dying to Know Death. Again, this was a uh, uh, 2012, they were just getting started with a handful of events. They hold it on August 8th, which is the middle of winter in Australia. So it's cloudy, it's dark, it's rainy. Time to talk about death. And uh, all of the blue dots indicate different events that were held around the country there. One of the things about Dying to Know Death, there is a template that is offered as a Creative Commons license for free that you could take what they're doing in Australia and see if you could do it at your, in your market. And in 2013, death discussion movements exploded. And we have our first US initiatives that came on the scene. Death Over Dinner originated at the University of Washington Graduate School with a course called Let's Have Dinner and Talk About Death, put together by Michael Hebb and Scott Macklin. The first Death Over Dinner evening was August 24th of 2013 with 500 dinners around the world in 20 countries. Since then, they have had more than 100,000 people use their template to hold death over dinner discussions. So these are smaller groupings where people would go to deathoverdinner.org, say who they want to have death discussions with over dinner, uh, if it's your family, your friends, your church, what do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about advanced medical directives? Do you want to talk about funeral planning? They will give you a script to use to actually carry out a successful death over dinner event. Also in 2013, anybody know this lady? That's me with Caitlin Doty, the founder of the Order of the Good Death. She is a um, Funeral industry rabble browser. She has two New York Times best-selling books about the funeral industry. She is a prolific YouTube video creator. She has more than 600,000 followers on YouTube. And when she uploads a video within four days, it has over 100,000 views. We were um, meeting up at NFDA. We happened to 
be at the booth for um, alkaline hydrolysis. So one word, aquamation. When I talk to the public and I tell them about alkaline hydrolysis, they're like, I want that. I would much rather have a warm bath than go into a glass furnace. So something to think about. Caitlin is also known for the term death positivity. So a death salon, she held her first one in Los Angeles in 2013, is like the salons of old, where you would come together with intellectuals and artists and free thinkers to talk about, in this case, mortality issues, to normalize the discussion and, and think about what we might want to do. So Caitlin held these events in other cities, in San Francisco, in London, in Houston. Last year's in Boston sold out tickets within 24 hours. Now, these are limited to maybe a few hundred people, but she is looking to take this idea of the death salon to the next level. So you may be seeing more of these in your markets, and it could be an opportunity to get involved. And then we had Before I Die festivals. In, um, in Wales and the UK, back to the, the cold and rainy England, uh, for a uh, part of Dying Awareness Matters Week. So like Dying Matters Awareness Week, you had a whole range of activities that people could participate in. It jumped the pond and came to the United States in 2016. The University of Indiana Nursing School got a grant to hold a three-day festival. It had 800 participants at 28 events. <coughs> Later that year, it was in Louisville, Kentucky. And they, over the course of the month, had 700 participants at about 17 events. So, of course, Gail Rubin finds out about this, and uh, I had to have one in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We had 600 participants at 22 events over six days. That was pretty good, so we decided to do another one last year. But it's now before I die New Mexico because we're holding events in Santa Fe as well as Albuquerque and also had events in uh, Belen where the uh, natural burial ground provided two burial plots as the grand prize for a drawing. So for our sponsors, which included National Guardian Life and EternityGardens.com and locally, Passages International and my friends at French Funerals and Cremations, thank you, Chris, we had a whole host of events, which included something kind of groundbreaking. The, the Millennial Morticians with Amy Q. Brews is up in the upper right-hand corner, 30-something, funeral directors and funeral interns talking in a bar about the funeral business. It was really successful. And the lower picture was Fathers Building Futures, which is a social enterprise nonprofit that gives jobs and skills to ex-convicts. And they make caskets and urns in their woodworking shop. So we did a tour there. So here's an idea. Why not have your own one or two day before I die festival? Work with folks to, uh, there's Chris, showing people what cremated remains look like before they are processed. We, we have people who are fascinated with that. Sorry, Doug, but people do want to know what goes on in the, in the retort. We also work with local attorneys, estate planning attorneys. You could work, team up with hospices, uh, with veterinarians, with grief counselors, various companies that could help sponsor and participate in panel discussions and be speakers. We also did a uh, workshop for obituary writing. There was the Reimagine End of Life Festival held in San Francisco and in New York. Hundreds of events, thousands of participants. And the End Well Symposium is a one-day event they've been holding in San Francisco, which draws hundreds of people, who, by the way, are paying between $200 and $770 to attend to, to listen and learn about making the end of life 
experience something more human-centered. I just got an email yesterday from the Endwell people saying they are taking this show on the road, so you may be seeing Endwell symposiums in your market. And lastly, think about perhaps a one-day creative community outreach event. Rest Kingdom <coughs> Funeral Home and Cemetery in Rockwell, Texas, had an evening of laughter and learning. They brought me in, I did my kicking the bucket list, downsizing and organizing things to do before you die talk. And guess what? They had 140 people come to the funeral home on a rainy Tuesday night, and they had laughed. Look, they're smiling. There must be somebody really popular there at the funeral home. Um, but notice all the gray hair, too. One of Rest Haven's signature branding pieces is a rocking chair. Their theme is get comfortable. Get comfortable with that. And we did a drawing for one of their rocking chairs. So this is the door prize registration form. We got their names, their ages, how they heard about the event. And would you like to learn more about your options for prearrangements? So we found out, you can find out what works best for you in terms of marketing these kind of events, or any kind of events. We found out their age. 75% of these people were between in their 60s or in their 70s. And as for learning about their options for prearrangements, out of 140 attendees, we got 105 drawing slips, some of which had couples on them, so it represented even more people. And we had 14 people say, yes, I would like to learn more. And within a week, Nancy Starnes, the woman who is the pre -need counselor there, had sold enough property and pre -need planning to more than recoup her costs for this event. Plus, they had the contact information for the 41 people who said no and the 47 people who didn't answer that question. And she was able to go back to them and offer a discount on cemetery property they wanted to sell before they opened a new section in their cemetery. So the baby boomers want to talk about death. And the conversations are being held. What could your funeral homes and cemeteries be doing to be a part of these conversations and to generate more cleaning business? You can do it. Let's get those conversations started.